Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Tammy. I'm an alcoholic. Tammy! I want to stand up because, like, up here I can't see everybody. I didn't realize that. Um, So, hi. Uh, I didn't really say yes to speaking at this meeting. I asked my, I'm a speaker picker here. It's kind of douchey to pick yourself as a speaker. Um, But I asked my sponsor to speak, and she said, sure, but you're speaking with me. Like, never mind. I don't want you to speak. Never mind. (laughs) Um, So my sobriety date is March 29th, 2018. So I'm getting super close to two years. Um... And I was reading the big book today, and I want to share this with you. Um, so my sponsee has um, fallen off the map, and it's kind of sad. But um, what that means is that one time a week less, I'm reading the big book, right? So I just kind of picked it up today and started over from the beginning. And in the forward to the first edition, um, they say, we would like it understood that our alcoholic work is an avocation. The fuck is avocation? Okay. Look up avocation. It means hobby or minor occupation. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought that that really hit home to me because um, I have done all the work, right? I have worked the 12 steps. I have sponsored to some extent. I have been of service, right? I am, I'm done, right? I'm done. Like my brain and my body and my head and my alcoholic mind tell me, cool, check, did alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm cured. (laughs) See you guys. Um, But what I also know from reading the rest of those pages in there is that um, it's not a cure, it's a recovery. And if I stop, I stop being recovered. Um, I also know that I've been telling my therapist I want a hobby for a while, and it turns out I had one. (laughs) Um, So, but, you know, I shared at Chips and Cake a couple weeks ago, um, and uh, I, um, I told this, I told a couple of people in a week one time, these people I meet regularly because I have children and they go to the fucking hospital and shit. Um, and they're like, they, you know, people ask what you're doing that weekend. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to meet my friends on Friday. They go, you go out every Friday night with your friends? And I'm like, yeah. They're like, wow, I wish I would do that. You know, and then the same thing happened on a Thursday night. And it really hit home to me that this thing that I've been seeking outwardly since my childhood, this place to be, this group to belong to, um... I have it, you know, and what I didn't realize is that that doesn't mean I'm fucking comfortable, Um, right, but I have it, I have a group full of people um, who may not love me and want to hang out with me, but literally want the best for me, Um, so what it was like really quickly was it was hell by the end of the, uh, By the end of my drinking, it was daily drinking, quitting every morning, finding my reason to drink through the day, usually a resentment-based reason, sometimes a joy-based reason, a celebration, but most often a resentment-based reason, drinking every night, and then repeat on on a cycle, Um, doing some shit that I was ashamed of. You know, I, I managed to not end up, you know, uh, homeless and stuff. So the shit I did that was shameful was like pass out in the middle of a blackout, pass out reading my children bedtime stories and wake up in the morning and have them talk about slapping me in the face and not being able to wake me up. And like, they're laughing and I, but I can also see they're fucking scared cause you're supposed to be able to wake your mom up, you know? Um, you know, just, uh, fear every night that something would happen. You know, I would drink to passing out every night and we literally have a crackhead in our duplex. Like it's us, the family, and then this lovely woman, Cheryl, who 
leads a different life than us. <laughs> um, and so like she smokes and I passed out and she can, her drug addict self can fall asleep smoking a cigarette and my passed out self who didn't put the batteries in the thing could totally sleep through the alarm. And it was just, it was, it was, I was full of shame, you know, uh, I wasn't doing anything the way I wanted to be doing it, the way I thought was the right way. What I do learn in this program is I get to let go of a lot of that. Um, so I came in here when I got insurance. That wasn't a plan. It just happened. And um, I wanted to do CDRP, but I didn't have the time because <laughs> um, it's rough being a single mom with a job. Um, and so I did a week of CDRP. Actually, I did nine days of CDRP. And then they're like, you're going to have to go to a program. And I came here because it's evidence-based, like it's been here since 39, right? This is the place that I know for sure works. I know there's that recovery one with the golden book, and I know there's this other one, and there's this other one, and there's this other one, but I don't fucking know their track record, and I know AA works. And so I came here super willing to work the program. I was very, very lucky you could say or because it's a spiritual program my higher power gave me a sponsor who was able to frame uh the higher power in a way that I could accept um because if 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 she had done it any other way I probably would have walked at some point or had you know had a resentment or not been able to believe um I worked the steps as quickly and as slowly as I could um I really was amazed at how at how it works right the solution looks nothing like the program it pro, pro the solution looks nothing like the problem and it's ridiculous to me still how journaling about your anger and you know apologizing when you're wrong because you've journaled so much about your anger you realize that it's okay to apologize when you're wrong you're not gonna fucking die you know uh, <laughs> um, it's amazing that that shit that has nothing to do with alcohol is what keeps me sober um but it it worked i was relieved pretty quickly of the obsession to drink, but I do remember those days, uh, the early days of raising my hand and saying like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do when three o'clock rolls around. Cause that's where I would start looking for my reasons three in the afternoon. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And three o'clock would roll around and I would, I wouldn't text. I wouldn't call people cause I'm not going to call people, but <laughs> I did eventually, but I would text what I would do when I had a craving is I would text every single person who had AA as their last name in my phone book and, and until somebody immediately texted me back and then I would talk through my craving with them. And then the blessing of that was all throughout the rest of the evening from three to 10 people would be getting off work or seeing their phone and they would be responding to my text. So even long after the craving had passed, I had people supporting me all through the night. Um, and it's, it's what got me through because I, the, the obsession was there for a couple of months. Um, and it has been lifted. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think about alcohol. It just means that I'm not obsessed with it. Um, and it means that that also, because I work the steps, I have the tools to, know what to do when I think about alcohol so that even if the thinking about alcohol and I'm, it sounds good in the moment, I can play the tape. I can um, call my sponsor. I can call someone who's who, who the obsession has not been lifted on. I can work through all of the many, many reasons why my brain is lying to me and it's not a good fucking idea to have a drink, you know? Um, and I don't, how much time do I have left? Cause I'm running out of shit to say. <laughs> ah, there we go. One minute. <laughs> Maybe a little more, but she, she gave me a break. So, um, I'm super nervous up here. I'm so happy that this meeting is here. The one thing I love about the double speaker meeting is, I don't sit in the audience wondering what I'm going to fucking say. It is, it is just this relief, you know? I do go to meetings. I need to share at meetings. But here it's just like, 
it's just program and and I can let go completely and be myself here and hear what I need to hear and I'm so grateful for that. I hope you heard something and um, that's all I got. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm an alcoholic. Um, so I was really nervous about this and shared at a meeting earlier this week and so that share was the really powerful one, so <laughs> there's other meetings. Anyways, um, you know, I very much appreciate Tammy asking me to share. Um, I realized when she asked me to share that it's a really long share, and I do know how to talk for a really long time, and any of my sponsees will tell you that. Um, but uh, I realized also that I rarely share and talk about, like, what happened as far as like my drinking. So I want to welcome all the very new and fresh people that are not from this area also. And happy birthday, Nikki. Um, it's also leap year. So you, you won't hear this share for another four years. I've been holding on to that one for a while. Also. So, um, you know what it was like when I was drinking, um, I started drinking really early. I grew up in this area. Um, I, I grew up in Berkeley, so, like, for me, um, drinking and pot use, drugs are a huge part of my story. So, it just, it was really normalized, and um, it wasn't something that, like, I had a lot of shame around. It was something that, like, my father is an alcoholic, and he was in these rooms, and, like, one of the things for me was, with him specifically, was, like, he was really, like, a rageful, what I would deem dry drunk. And um, I didn't ever want any version of a sobriety that looked anything like him. I'm like, if that's what sobriety is like, I'm hella good, dude. I like being drunk. <laughs> so, you know, I would, I, I, you know, fifth, I think, you know, I don't remember exactly how old I was. I didn't have one of those, like, the first time I drank moments of clarity. I just, like, I distinctly remember drinking a lot, like summer of eighth grade a year, like these huge bottles of Carlo Rossi and like just fucking getting shit based and like running out of my friend's house because her mom came home and like drunk running. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, so like that was, and then I went to high school and I went to Berkeley high and like we could have off campus lunch, which just equated like off campus, everything. Um, and it's really interesting. I have a 15 year old right now who is at Berkeley high. And, um, one of my English teachers oversees this thing that I was doing with her recently. And, uh, she's like, God, you were so quiet in ninth grade. And I'm like, yeah, cause my Coca-Cola can had gin in it. And my, <laughs> I had to get really drunk in the morning before I, so that I could be drunk during the day and then sober up before I got home. And I thought I was really slick. And anyway, so you know, all through high school, I drank, um, and I, there were definitely, like, trying times during my, like, high school years, like, fucked up shit happened to me, um, my mother was dying from the time I was 11 until the time she died when I was 16, and, um, I just really, like, for me, drinking took me out of all of the things, you know, the things, all of them, and, um, and it also, like, in a sober lens, like, it didn't allow me to deal with any of the things. So, like, you know, trauma is happening to me and, like, I'm not dealing. I'm just drinking. And, like, it wasn't a problem to me. Again, I'm like, I'm not my dad. Like, he's a rageful, like, you could probably use a drink, bro. <laughs> like, so, for, so to me, I was like, okay, cool. Like, then my mother died. My father and I really clashed a lot. He threw me out. Um, I went and moved in with a friend of mine um, who, unbeknownst to me, her mother smoked crystal meth all night. <laughs> so she also let us drink tequila all day. And so I dropped out of school. Um, we were like the popular ones. We threw parties, house parties all the time. I was shit wrecked. I don't remember any of that year, which to me was like, cool, this is how I processed my mother's death. And then that woman threw me out. And, um, my grandmother, my mother's mother intervened and like sent me up to the butt fuck middle of nowhere, Dunsmere, California. <laughs> and, um, I figured out that like bonfires are a real thing <laughs> and, um, people actually like drive to the edge of cliffs and jump off them into water. And I was like, what the fuck is going on out here? <laughs> and, um, I skated through that entire year, just drinking a lot and like a lot. And, um, 
you know, for, in, for me, I was like, I'm a kid. Like, yeah, this is what we do. Everyone I knew drank the way that I drank. And so I was like, it never dawned on me that, it, that this was the alcoholic. Like I had no idea, no conception of what that was. So I graduated. And the next day I was on the Amtrak back down to the Bay area. Um, I joined AmeriCorps. I started community college. I was like, I'm good. That like high school drinking thing has to be like cut down to the weekends now. Um, and again, like I kind of felt like I had life together kind of. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I met my now child's father who, you know, you're not going to get into that whole thing, but it was like immediate problems from the very beginning. Um, I ended up leaving because things were so abusive with him and moving back up North because it was the only place that I kind of felt like I was farther, farther, further enough away. And like, I knew some people. So I moved up there and, um, I mm -hmm. ended up pregnant and, um, then I came back down here and there's a lot, like, there's a lot of domestic violence. There's a lot of violence in that. And I'm not going to get into that, but there was a lot of fucking scary shit going on. There was a lot of rejection from my like immediate family. Like my father, when the abuse got really bad and I was too pregnant to have an abortion, I really wanted to like be safe. And he told me like, you should go to a, um, a homeless shelter. There's a lot of them in the area. And like, so I just felt like, I felt alone and I felt trapped and I was pregnant and I was 20 and I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, and I didn't drink. I smoked pot a couple of times while I was pregnant. And I really, again, like to me, I wasn't, I wasn't a problem drinker. I just like drank in high school and that's what we did. Like we partied and drank. And, um, then I had my daughter and the abuse got went from really bad to worse. And then it, it started this like, really long process of trying to run away from him, um, moved in my brother, moved away with my brother and moved my best friend in stalking and like him actively trying to kill me was a regular thing. And, um, for me, like the way I escaped was I was 21 at this point, I would go to the bar and I would drink and I would, there was this like two for five night, um, at this place up on Telegraph and it was great cause I would buy four drinks at a time and like drink two of them at the bar and then walk to the table with the others. And like the whole objective is like get fucked up as quick as possible. And, um, and again, like I didn't think I was a fucking alcoholic. Like I didn't really know what an alcoholic was. So, you know, when we talk about like having alcoholism, I know what that means now. I had no concept of what that meant. And I thought it meant like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what I became <laughs> so anyways, getting into the future. Uh, so anyways, uh, then I finally ended it up, um, involving the police and like going into domestic violence shelter. Um, some shit happened at the domestic violence shelter, which ended up my daughter that I was trying to like keep away from him ended up back with him and uh then uh the court system got involved and cps got involved and in order for me to maintain custody of my daughter i had to go into a rehab facility because i tested positive for shrooms and weed and again like these were things i was doing but not around my kid and so i was like okay cool because like the objective for me at that point was like be safe um so i stayed at this rehab that I really didn't identify with, um, at all. Like there were women in there. So the whole thing was like, see, I had an open CPS case. And if you've ever had an open CPS case with something related, like I could not leave this facility with my daughter or they would take custody from me. So I stayed in here and there were a lot of women in there that were, um, that had no custody of their children due to like crystal meth, their babies being born dirty, um, meth, crack, things that I've never even like thought of doing, especially not pregnant. And so there was no identification for me. And so I really learned the value or the, I don't really call it a value, but like, I really like took on the, like, fake it till you make it. Like I was faking it in there. I knew how to talk all the NA language, like all the AA mumbo jumbo. I was all over it. Like I really just wanted to be safe. And I made sure the counselors knew what was going on. Cause I had, I'm actually, st I still really 
I'm close with one of the counselors. Actually, I spoke to her this week. Um, but it was, this, this facility was 24 hours. So there was always someone there to talk to. And I was really afraid of my kid's dad. So like, for me, like, that's why I was there. I was there because I needed safe housing from my kid's father. And, um, and I felt really bad for the other women that were in there, but like, I wasn't like them. That wasn't me. And so I spent 18 months there. I got out. I really liked the camaraderie in NA. I really liked the community in a, in NA. So I started going to NA meetings. I got in, in Oakland, I got a sponsor. My sponsor gave me really shitty, weird advice all the time. Um, we never really worked NA steps. We'd sit at our house and chain smoke cigarettes, drink coffee and read tarot cards. We'd talk about our chakras. I really thought that I was doing the program. I went to meetings regularly. Okay. Like I was sober. Like, you know, I thought I was doing the thing. I, you know, and I thought like, I honestly thought like the steps were an option. Like, it was, that's, you know, and, 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 you know, and like for those of you that are new, like those of them, the people that are laughing is because like the steps are not an option. It's like mandatory if you're going to have this other way of living, because like, I don't know how to live without drugs and alcohol just left to my own accord. So like tarot reading didn't help like chakra and shit. That didn't help. Like, I mean, I was sober, but like I was, I had no tools on how to work. Like, and also like nothing really started like going bad yet. So like things were relatively good at this point. Like I was in school, I had my own apartment. My kid's father was still like off doing whatever the fuck. Well, what he was doing was preparing to take me to family court after his restraining order ran out and it did. And then shit hit the fan, and the only thing I knew how to do was escape back with drugs. So I started smoking weed. Weed was never an issue for me in my mind. Weed was a thing I used for anxiety. And so if you're one of those people that likes to smoke weed, you might not be able to, like, find the spiritual attainment that you're looking for. But, like, that's none of my business. I couldn't. So I started smoking weed, and then I pretty quickly burnt my entire life to the ground. But like, it didn't really look like that on the outside. It looked like everything else was the problem. My kid's father was the problem. Like I had to drop out of school because he was harassing me again, which was like, yes, it's true. Like my kid's father is still an active part of my life. However, it doesn't throw me off the way that it did before. Because again, I had no tools at all. I had no really, I had no grounding in anything. So Fast forward a little bit. There was a lot of shit that went on. There was a lot of moving around. There was a lot of family court. There was a lot of shit that my daughter had to walk through and like be a part of, be at the effect of. So, um, 2014, my drinking really started getting out of control. I was drinking a lot, um, not to where it got, but, um, I was drinking a lot and um i started having some really visceral flashbacks of some shit that happened to me when i was a child and um long story short i wound up in john george which is a psychiatric ward and um you know here's the thing about like doctors when you don't tell them that you use drugs and you drink like a fish and then you stop abruptly like, it looks like you're having a fucking psychiatric break. And, like, I never, which I, like, and also, like, I'm really stressed out and I do have anxiety and I do suffer from PTSD. I'm actively working on that right now. But, like, I never told the doctors what was going on. So they just slapped me with medications. And, um, and then when you're drinking on those medications, that's also not a good idea. So I get out of the psych ward and, um, I had lost full, I had lost complete custody of my kid. I was in there for about, I don't even remember how many days, but like I show up at her school to go pick her up and they arrest me and throw me back into the psych ward. And uh, I lost everything. I lost my housing. I lost any money that was coming to me. Um, I lost full custody of my kid. I had no financial means to fight him in court. And, um, and I was like, I mean, you talk about like case of the real life buckets. I was like, fuck it. I give up. Everything was gone. Everything. I threw away everything. Everything in my life was gone. And I moved in with a friend of mine who drank a lot. And I was like, cool, I guess we're going to see what dive bars and fucking bar life in Oakland looks like, because I had never really had the capacity to do that because I had a kid at home and I was a full-time student at San Francisco state. And so, uh, I did that for a while. It was really fucking shit. 
Dive bars in Oakland are shitty. <laughs> They're disgusting. It's fucking crap. It's the same shit birds every fucking night. And, like, I was one of them. Like, I know because I was there every fucking night. You know, and, like, I had, I, I had no capacity to work. I was depressed. I was angry. So I was like, cool, I'm going to just fucking pull a geographic and I moved to Florida to live with my grandmother. Intermittently, I was like pretending to get sober over here for a little bit and over here for a little bit. I would like, I was like, I was like, I would do speak, I would share high on weed. <laughs> and like, it was one of these like, these motherfuckers don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Or like, they don't know I'm high. Like, anyways, I don't know what the fuck I was trying to prove. I brought it to myself. I was trying to prove something that I could like be sober and stay high because I really didn't want to let go of weed. Um, so I, I moved to Florida. The whole plan there. Cause I, you know, I planned out all my life here and like none of my plans worked out. Um, so I planned to move to Florida, um, live there, get, get settled there. My grandmother was a little bit sick or she said she was a little bit sick. And, um, and then I was going to regain custody out there because I could like get, get on my foot, get on my feet there. And, um, my grandmother was actually much sicker than she let on like dying sick. And so what actually ended up happening was I became her full-time, um, caregiver and, um, and I basically helped her die, uh, which really put a, uh, like wrench in my fucking plans and, um, and really fucked me up, honestly, because here I am now, like, I don't want a hard drink in front of my dying grandmother. So she thinks it's socially acceptable to down wine. So I'm like pounding wine back after she passes out, but not enough to be completely, blacked out because I need to be able to know if she's wake, if she's woken up or not. So, you know, again, like I thought it was controlling, you know, I thought it, I had had it under control. Um, so yes. Okay. This is faster. I can get sober now. So fuck. Yeah. It's perfect timing. Um, so she dies. I moved to Texas, which is where my, my middle younger brother is. My youngest brother is actually living in the tenderloin completely out of his fucking mind, which is really sad. Um, but so I moved to Texas again. I was going to try to get on my feet there. I completely wrecked my brother's wedding, which I actually just made an amends for, um, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, there's a lot more wreckage with that, but, um, then he threw me out. I moved back to California. Um, I, I was partying one night when I first got back to California and I ran into, um, the friend that I lived with after high school, her ex-husband, was at this bar that I was at, at the after hours, just to kind of, I didn't know what that meant till later, but he became my Coke dealer and my roommate. Um, <laughs> so that was just a shit show. And like, it got really fucking weird, really fast. Like cocaine really brought me to my bottom really fucking fast. And, um, so then in June, um, June 8th, actually, I know the date because it's my best friend's birthday. Um, June 8th, I, uh, her and I are at, now we don't go to dive bars anymore. Cause now I'm fancy, right? Cause <laughs> I do cocaine. So I'm fucking fancy. So <laughs> I'm at make Westing getting shit faced and coked out of my brain. And, um, this guy is sitting at the bar. He's older and bald. And I'm like, okay, buddy. And he's like, I know you. I'm like, you don't know me. He's like, you used to go to NA. I'm like, oh shit, my, you might know me. <laughs> and I'm like, but you're at the bar. He's like, you want a drink? I'm like, yes. And so does my best friend it's her birthday he's like oh it's her birthday we should go do rails of coke i'm like yes we should <laughs> fuck hell yeah so like he became my like my love i was like yes and like honestly we could if you would have asked me then i knew this dude for like a really long time i got sober june 15th okay my sobriety date is june 16th but that's only because i was doing cocaine at uh 8 a.m on the 15th so i had to set my date to the 16th so fast forward on like whatever long binge that was which again like i thought like we were together all this time it was really fast really fast Fast. So it's 8 a.m. on the 15th. He leaves to go to work, and I'm like, fuck, I'm still awake from God ever, whatever day. 
what day is it? Where am I? How the fuck am I going to get out of here? Because I don't like going into the daylight on cocaine because people will see that I'm really actually not fancy. I'm a drug addict. <laughs> so I'm like, shit. And I'm lining up lit lines and I'm, I, I take a hit. And uh, I hear my grandmother's voice tell me to flush it down the toilet. And I was like, what the fuck? This is some crazy shit. <laughs> and I line up another one. And, and like, I, I may have took one or two. I don't really remember. But I ended up actually flushing it down the toilet, rinsing it down the drain. And I was like, that was fucking weird. I called an Uber. This Uber driver, he was an older guy. He wanted me to sit in the front, which I thought was weird. And he was like, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm a drug addict. <laughs> and he was like, oh, have you ever heard of Delancey Street? And if you're from here, it's a, that's a recovery home over in San Francisco. And I was like, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> he drops me off at my girlfriend's house, who was supposed to smoke weed with me so that I could come down from whatever crazy shit was just going on. And I'm telling her all this. And she's like, you should go to a meeting. And I was like, bitch, you're betraying me but like i was so it was so weird like the course of events that were going on this morning i was like i am fucking okay i might yeah let's go so i, I jump in another uber i get to central office which is the old central office they've moved it now which makes me resentful but whatever um so i get to central office i'm like an hour and a half early and there's this chick there who's like handing me cigarettes and smoking with me and I'm coked out of my fucking brain at this point. I'm like, I'm, what am I doing here? I guess this is happening. Like, okay. Some chain smoking cigarettes, the meeting, I couldn't tell you what the fucking meeting said at all. Save my fucking life. The next day, which is my actual um, sobriety day, so June 16th, 2016, um, I call my best friend and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to try this sober thing. I, you know, And she's like, I'll come with you. Then we go to uh, Wild Bunch. The speaker became my sponsor. Um, and, like, she also got sober. And, like, you know, for me, this was, like, you know, I didn't walk into this shit willingly. Like, that shit, I did not make that up. Whether I was high or whatever, like, I was definitely high. And I was high for a really long time after. Like, the shakes were bad. I was really angry. AA was really, like, the last it was, I didn't really want to be in here. I thought everyone knew my fucking dad, you know, I didn't want to be in here, you know, talking about how much I fucking hated him. Cause like, you know, I'm like, I'm resentful and hateful and rageful. And like, I fucking hate everything when really like it all boiled down to like, I hated me a lot and I didn't know how to like do that part. Right. The steps helped me learn how to deal with like me. It helped me learn how to deal with like the shit that I really didn't want to fucking deal with, which is like my anger, my mother dying, fucking like being an alcoholic. Like what the fuck? I didn't sign up for this shit. I want to be able to drink like normal people, whatever the fuck that actually means. Like it was so funny. Like earlier in sobriety, I was at this this meeting and this guy was like, yeah, you know, if I could just go to the bar every night and drink two glasses of wine, I'd be fine. And I was like, if you could go to the bar every night and drink two glasses of wine. Oh, okay. I've watched people who I would deem normal drinkers, like leave entire glasses of wine on the table. I'm like, what are you fucking doing? You're wasting it. I will help you. Like, what the fuck's your problem? So like, I just, I really want to get like more into to like so the steps like these are mandatory whatever i was doing in na it's i mean and, 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 and like if na works for you like just do the steps with a sponsor that you trust um in the first year of my sobriety like i bounced around to quite a few different sponsors because i didn't really find anyone that i could trust and i think a lot of that like looking back on it was because i was insane in my fucking head still like i was really all over the place i was really coming down hard. I really wanted like meetings to be the solution because I thought that that's what was working before for everyone. I thought that's what everyone was doing in the meetings before. It was like, cause that's what I was doing. <laughs> of course, that's what everyone else was doing. But like, I'm like, Oh, I can take that for the rest of my life. That one thing that that guy said that day, I'm taking that like, Oh, Nikki, you've got 32 years. Like I'm going to take that all week. Like, <laughs> let me tell you when you're new, like fucking shit, I can hold on to something for like that's it. <laughs> then it's gone. Like, what the fuck? I'm done. Like, where the fuck am I? Why am I here? This fucking bitch is yelling at me. Like, I, you know, I, it was, I, I also, like, I really didn't want to, like, 
I really didn't want to look at shit. Like, so, you know, all you got to do when you're new is like find a sponsor that you trust. And, uh, and that has something I, you know, it's like a lot of it for me used to be like, Oh, find a sponsor that, uh, wants what, or has what you want or has what you want or whatever. Like, it's not really for me. Like for me, I, I want a sponsor who, who likes what they have. Right. Mm-hmm. My sponsor has got like 34 years and like, she's a shit wreck most of the time, <laughs> but like she's sober and she devotes her entire fucking life to service and she's fired up for fucking AA. I want that at 34 years because what I saw my father having, I never want that. I want to actually be happy in my life. Like I like my life today a lot. I did regain custody of my daughter $30,000 later. Which was like the money that my grandmother left me when she died. I bought a car that I started driving Uber for and I got custody of my daughter back because that's what my grandmother wanted me to do. And for a long time, my higher power when I walked in here was butterflies. They're tattooed all over my body because of that, because I also started getting a lot more work done when I was sober. And they remind me of what the fuck's going on here. Because like, I don't really know what's going on here like at all. But I know that like, if I put one foot in front of the other and I reach out to a newcomer and I pray and I meditate and I work these fucking steps to the best of my ability on a continual basis, shit gets easier to deal with. The tools that I have today are more than when I walked in here. The only tool I had was like telling the entire room to go fuck themselves (laughs) because I really enjoyed hearing people say, keep coming back. (laughs) Okay. Like I really wanted people to like me, but I was an asshole. So like, it was hard. Like women didn't like me, which like was shocking to me. And I, and you know, and like, I also really like wore the victim cape. Like I, I really like, if you drank the way I drank, like we all have shit that goes on in our fucking lives. The bottom line is like, I'm an alcoholic. And in order for me to learn how to live life on life's terms every day, because I wake up and I don't like me. I don't like my brain. My brain fucking fucks with me while I'm sleeping. Like what kind of <laughs> shit is that? That's my alcoholism. Like I have to wake up and fucking pray. I like pray. Please just help. I have a 15 year old. Like I want to kill her most mornings. Like I don't kill her. Let's like, that's progress. Like, I mean, I never killed her, obviously. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm talking about right now. Um, the, steps, the steps are great. I'm reading another fifth step next weekend. I still have shit. You know, my, my fourth step is not as big as it was the first two times I did it. Um, you know, and it's the core shit for me right now. And, uh, (laughs) it's a lot of fear. It's a lot of fear. And, uh, what I came in here thinking was, oh, I'm just, I I hate everything. I'm angry. I'm angry. You know, so anger was the, the coping skill. And I thought it was a skill. I was just talking to my sponsee about that earlier today. I was like, I thought it was a skill, like my anger, it'll keep you the fuck away from me, which was the objective. Right. But also like, it also really blocked me off from anything good coming my way. And, um, what I've learned is that it's actually a character defect. And, uh, I didn't know any of this language. Like if nothing, nothing makes sense when you're new, like you just got to keep coming back. You actually have to keep coming back. You have to keep getting your seat, your, your ass in the seat, you know, and like try to hear something, you know, that's going to keep you until the next, next whatever. Right. I used to leave the late show, which is a 10 PM meeting when I was new and go, to the fucking bar because I did not know how to socialize. Everyone was fucking like chain smoking cigarettes, which was cool, right? For like 10 minutes and then people would ask me questions. I'm like, mm. <laughs> I'm out of here so I can go like talk to the drunks. Like, cause that's what I was used to. And like, and after a while, like that obsession to be in that environment lifted. And I wouldn't recommend that by the way, cause it was not easy for me to stay sober in that space. But it was also like, it's really hard. Like, how do we, like, I had a, a sponsee the other day say, like, how do you get relationships? She's got, like, almost 60 days right now. And I'm like, it, it comes with time. A lot of time. You know, like, we're not instant best friends like we are at the bar. Like, oh, my God, I love you. That doesn't happen. In, I mean, maybe it does in here. If that happens for you in here. Like, that's amazing. That does not happen for me in here. People are like, stay away from me. I mean, until people stop saying that, you know. I made a couple of men's group level, you know. And men's are a real thing. Those promises, we read them at the beginning of each meeting. They are the ninth step promises. So, like, you have to get through some of the ninth step, which is like making amends to people, which means you have to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
and then start doing nine for those promises to really come true. And they are true. Like fear of economic insecurity. I still have that, but I don't want to kill myself over it. Mm -hmm. Like I actively wanted to kill myself all the time over everything. What they did, what I was doing, what I wasn't doing. Like I remember when I hit 30, I was like, Oh my God, all the things that I thought I needed, they're not here. Like what the fuck I'm going to drink now. Like drinking was my solution for everything. And the solution now is like, breathe, pray, help someone else. That's what I do. I hated when my fucking sponsor started saying that shit to me. I'm like, I want you to hear me on my soapbox right now, lady. Like, you know, I'm having this fucking problem. Today, I had this thing. I have a 15-year-old, so there's always a thing right now. And I ran through her phone last night, and I found out some shit I didn't really want to find out. And, um... I was like, she was like, so I sent her a text message like, I need to talk to you right now. It's like 7.30. <laughs> I'm fucking pissed. She's asleep. She calls me at like 11. <laughs> and I'm like moved through all of that because I prayed. Like I spoke to other people. You know, I, I got out of myself. And uh, and I, I did like a little brief meditation. And uh, And she's like, well, before you say anything, Michelle, let's say the serenity prayer. I'm like, oh, she thinks I'm pissed. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we say the serenity prayer, and she's like, you're not screaming at me, so what's going on? And I was like, well, you know, and, and so, like, that's my life today. Like, when she first started calling me out on my anger, I was, like, 18 months sober. And, and then I fired her three months later because, I didn't, you know, I didn't really realize what it was then. But, like, I didn't want... To, I didn't know how to let go of the anger. Like, I didn't know how to, like, start walking away from that. It was a thing that really I thought kept me safe when really, like, it hinders me so deeply. And, um, and that's, that's, that's part of, that's what my program looks like right now. You know, this is a daily moment to moment thing for me. And it's always been. Like, I was like, I'm just going to sit through the rest of this meeting, I guess. And then I might go to another one. I don't fucking know. I guess I can drink tomorrow. I don't know. If I see that person again, I'm going to fucking punch them. I fucking hate all of you in this meeting. I'm going to tell you all. Like, and then I'll stop telling you all. And then I'll tell you again. Like, you know, the reality is, is like, we're all in here. We're all alcoholics. We're all trying to fucking not drink anymore. And like, I don't. The only, the way I know I stayed sober in this program this long is that I picked up the phone over and over and over. Cause again, like people would not answer the phone for me. So like I would call like 12 people in a row and no one would answer the phone. And like by the 12th message, like it was probably not nice. I mean, let's be honest. Like the second message was probably pretty fucking rude. <laughs> but like, I, probably why I wasn't getting calls back. <laughs> I always pick up the phone. I always answer the phone. I like my entire life is about service. Like, however that looks like, and I'm much quicker to be of service to people who are in the program than I am outside of the program. But that doesn't mean that I'm not still of service outside of this program. Like I, my entire existence is about giving back to others, you know? And I don't know when that shift happened. I don't know if it was like, you know, I really, I did this amends with my grandmother, which is where that higher power really transformed for me. So again, when I got sober at the first, in, in the beginning, my higher power was butterflies because my grandmother loved butterflies. I really thought my grandmother had something to do with me being sober, whether she did or not, I don't know. So, um, and every time I did step work in the beginning, I would see butterflies and I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like on the right track. And, um, and I started getting on my body, so, like, I kind of would trick myself into being like, oh, that's not first thought. Uh, so I, I flew to Florida to, to, to do this amends with my grandmother. And, um, and like, sh that perspective shifted for me, where, like, the, you know, I, I, the only, the, what my sponsor suggested me to do was write her a letter and read it to her. And it was really hot. I was really sweaty. I was also like on my rag. Sorry guys. But like I could not sit down, which was the, the vision I had like sit on the beach. And like, then I was going to meditate while I burned this letter after I read it. I couldn't sit because it was 
was a heavy flow. So I had to stand in the ocean while I'm sweating profusely and bleeding. And I'm like, this is bullshit. Like, I don't just want this to be over. I'm like reading it. I really wanted the sky to like part, but it was a clear as fuck. There's none of that going on. And I'm like trying to burn it. And if you ever try to burn anything in the ocean, like it takes a while. So I'm trying to burn it and it starts burning. And I'm like, okay. And then I look up and there's a dolphin up above and I'm like now I'm crying and bleeding and sweating and I'm like oh god and like for me like that wasn't the aha like this is the immense it's the ripple effect after that it's the way that my higher power transformed for me after that moment because like I don't even remember what the fuck I wrote on that letter to be honest like I mean I remember those distinct things that I just told you because like honestly they're a little traumatizing for me and then you know I have no filter so I'm like I'm gonna tell people this shit and like so you know and then and then the other thing is also the other day I'm I'm getting ready to graduate from Mills College with my bachelor's degree and I, I started college when my daughter was eight months so like this is a huge thing like I ended up going back to school right I live on campus with my partner and my kid and I'm um, finally fucking graduating and I'm freaking out like this has been a 15 year like you know talk about cushion talk about fear <laughs> popping up for me I'm like this has been my my plight I'm like I'm single mother student <laughs> it's starting air and now it's like it's leaving so thank you this is a, my last story about butterflies <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm sitting in class. I just got my human subjects protocol approved, which I'm like flooded with like all this joy. It's been four months. I've been waiting for the shit to be approved. So it gets approved. I start feeling like I'm going to cry. And then I also am immediately flooded with like so much anxiety. I can't even fucking move. And there's other people that are not alcoholics around me. And I'm like I'm freaking out. <laughs> But, like, this is all happening inside my body. Like, my body is still physically uncomfortable all the time. So I'm like, oh, my God. Now I want to, like, cry and, like, smash my computer at the same time. And I get a call from a, a fellow, and I step outside, and I'm on the second floor. So all I can see are trees, the wind's blowing, the sun's on me. And he's like, I just saw the second butterfly. So I thought, after I saw the first one, I thought of you, and the second one was like, I have to call you. And I just was like... Oh God! Don't you love me, motherfucker? Oh, I talk to my higher power like that, and like so. This year was all over the place. You can also have a crazy ass share up here. Okay. Please just try to stay sober. Like we do this shit one at a, one one day at a time. We never do this shit alone. And like you can be as crazy or as serene as you want to be in here. And like we accept you no matter what. Like that's. That's the shit here. Like, we actually accept you. You find your people in here. Not everybody in here has to be your people, but, like, you get to find your people. And I have definitely found some people in here that I really fucking love and appreciate and value. And, like, I never had that shit. I had the best friend, like, drunken thing at the bar. And then I couldn't remember you remember their name if it fucking saved my life the next time we were drinking together. So just like, oh, hey, bro. Like, now I know people's names, you know? <laughs> That's real. Like, I take care of my kid. I show up for my life. Like, I answer the phone. Like, I love my life today. Like, I did not love my life when I walked in here. And, like, yeah. So, keep coming back. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.